So it's a real privilege for me to be here. It's also the content that we're going to talk about and hear about means a lot to me personally because the kind, working on the kinds of stories that make a difference to the world is really what brought me into journalism. And to this day, it's one of the most rewarding aspects of what I do when you feel that a conversation you had, a voice that you brought out on air, and an issue that, that your team decided to shine a spotlight on has led to people getting a different hearing and to putting something on the agenda that might not otherwise be. It's one of the best um, parts of the job I do today. So I'm really pleased that today is going to be all about hearing different perspectives on this point about creativity, social impact, great storytelling, solid research, um, 21st century society ideas and ideals and how all of that comes together. And so as you'd expect, there'll be people exploring that from different perspectives and you'll find a full program on uh, the back of your uh, badges. Um, which gives you a sense of what's coming up. And there will also be um, individual experts chairing the different discussions. So there's going to be a whole range of different perspectives. Um, and I know that we'll all gain new insights, even if this is already our world. So whether it's the untold story behind Fraggle Rock or how football manager the game has even been ahead of reality in, in what it's represented on air, there are all kinds of insights and stories that are going to come out today. We're going to begin, however, with um, someone who's such a pioneer in this area, and I'm so pleased she's here. She's a, she's a bundle of creativity and ideas, and um, definitely someone who really needs not much introduction, but please give a warm welcome to Gurinda Chadha, writer, director, creator, storyteller. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Gurinda, with someone like you, it's like, it's hard to know where to start, because you have such a fantastic body of work that, mm really has done everything that Okra is all about, because it's made us laugh, cry. I mean, certainly I cried and blinded by the light, mm. um, but really made us think. And it's how all of that comes together that's so important. Can we start with Bend It Like Beckham, though? Sure. Because it's 20 years, mm. can't, can't believe it really, but it's 20 years since that came out. And there's something that smashed stereotypes of Asian girls in particular. Mm. Was that what you were trying to do? Or was it a happy byproduct? Well, I think, let me take you back to when I was a girl. Um, my, one of my earliest uh, exchanges with authority, if you like, because Bend It Like Beckham is all about authority and challenging it, um, was at school, uh, I was one of the few Indian girls in the class, and I remember all these teachers sort of looking at us and saying, all oh, these poor Indian kids, they don't know if they're Indian or English, they've got an identity crisis. Do you and remember that being said, or you just... Yes, that were, those were discussions. And I remember thinking at the time, like, are you mad? Like, we, I don't have an idea. I know that, obviously, at home, I'm going to behave in a particular way and speak in a particular way. And at school, I'm going to talk about Donny Osmond or whatever, but I'm not going to do that at home sort of thing. So I realised that people saw me in a particular way, very different to how I saw myself. And then years later, at school, again, a careers teacher uh, was seeing all of us one by one. I was about 16 at the time. And the careers teacher, I said to the careers teacher, I'm, I want to go to university. I want to go to UEA uh, because it's the only school that does development studies. And I was very passionate about geography. And I know now why, because it gave me an international perspective. Uh, so I had decided that's what I wanted to do and the careers, careers teacher sort of looked at me and said, mm, I think you should think about secretarial college. And I said, I don't want to be a secretary. And she said, men need good secretaries. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, what is she thinking when she's looking at me? So I lived and breathed that idea of representation, you know, from a very young age. And so as I got older, I then realised um, the power of the media. And partly through Rock Against Racism, which I was, you know, uh, that really formed me, that whole period of growing up with the National Front and then uh, Rock Against Racism being an amazing interjection into that. And for me, it mass had a massive impact. That idea that white people were on my side when I saw them all sort of marching. You know, that was a massive thing for me as a kid. And then further from that, then the idea of realizing, again, when the riots happened, 
disturbances happened in Brixton. I remember there was a photograph on the cover of The Sun of uh, a black guy going like this with a, with a Molotov cocktail and about to throw it. And the headline was something like The Face of Britain Today. And I remember being so outraged by that and trying to unpick that before media studies became a thing, you know. And I realised the power of the camera and thought, OK, that's what I need to do. I, my life will be about challenging those kind of images, that kind of racism, but using the camera. And I thought the best way to do that was to become a BBC journalist. <laughs> and so I trained uh, to be a radio uh, journalist because I couldn't really spell. So that's why I went into radio. <laughs> OK, we won't get into well, whether or not that's essential. To well, no, it was. I'm kind of glad you didn't do this because there might have been no space for people like me. Dorinda. So I'm kind of like, no, just I... as well you ended up somewhere else. Well, no, it was fantastic because then again, I was in this position where I had a lot of... Uh, guys above me, very important English guys with white shirts and crisp, you know, crisp white shirts and ties, who were walking around the newsrooms very self-importantly. And whenever I wanted to sort of pose a story, a different perspective, they'd go, "No, that's not how we do it," you know. And I remember getting hauled into the controller's office in uh, Radio WM, uh, Birmingham, where I first started, uh, and I used, I said the wor word schedule. On air. And he hauled me in and said, we don't say schedule, we say schedule. Schedule is a nasty Americanism. And I was like, oh my God, what century are you from, mate? You know, uh, and, what year was this out of it? Uh, this is the 80s. And then something amazing and marvellous happened in Britain, which was the birth of Bhangra music, which for me just became... Uh, the most important cultural fo fo force because it was us making music in Birmingham and, and South or West London for ourselves, but it was being enjoyed all over the world. And I wanted to crystallise that, and that's why I made my first film, I'm British Part. But from that moment, a very important thing happened. I realised that was actually going to be a film about identity and music. And so it, so I called it I'm British, but dot, dot, dot. And it was, it, was a, a, it was a conversation about how someone like me can start talking about identity. And towards the end of it, I bring in um, uh, Gillian Wallabarg. I mean, it's got everything in it. And uh, all kinds of, uh, and, and all the activism, basically, and the murder of Gurdeep Singh Jagger in Southall and people standing up in Britain against race, racism. And I remember my uh, producer at the BFI main EP, Ben Gibson, came in and watched this, and he said, oh my God, Corinda, what are you doing? This is a film about music, not racism. And I remember, I remember turning around to Ben and saying, everything's about racism, Ben. Um, and so I put even more footage in. And if you see the film now, you'll see it sort of starts very sort of like light and about the music and fantastic and you're bopping along. And by the end, the mallet comes in. And actually, I've never moved away from that. That's what I do with every film. Yeah, and you've shown us time and time again that there doesn't have to be a trade-off between the message and the entertainment. No, and so with Bend It Like Beckham, yeah. most people think it's a lovely comedy, British comedy uh, and drama about a girl who wants to play football. It is at its core a film about racism. Absolutely, undoubtedly, it's about racism and sexism, but, but the, the heart of the story is about the father and the experiences that the father went through. And because he was so um, affected by racism, he's trying to hold his daughter close yeah. and doesn't want her to go out because he's trying to protect her yes. and from we're, racism. And, and but we're therefore, what you also haven't shied away from, far from it, is the battles, disagreements, barriers that you come up against within your own family and no. within your own community as well. Well, um, that's because you have to be authentic, yeah. you know, and with anything to do with uh, storytelling, you know, unless it comes from a, p a place of... Uh, knowledge and nuance from the inside, it's never authentic in yeah. my book. 
Um, I want to get a, at least a question or two. Gorinda could, as you could see, quite happily fill the time all by herself, and we want to hang on her every word. But I do want to get to a question or, or two from, from all of you. But before that, I want to ask you, so, um, so what do you put on the tin? And I mean when you're pitching, right? If you're, if you're, if you're trying to, like, like when you said to Ben, everything's about racism. Mm -hmm. at, even with all your success, at the point that you're push, putting a new project forward, which does have a strong social message, which you are aiming to have social impact, do you have to soften it when you're trying to get the funding? Um, I think you you talk about it in different terms. You know, um, you you. I could never have said. I mean, it took me ages to get Bender Luck Beckham financed anyway, because everyone was like, no one wants to watch a film about an Indian girl trying to bend a ball like David Beckham. You know, so everyone was like, that's never going to work. And it's amazing now, looking back 20 years, that that film holds one statistic that no other film in the world has, is that it's the only film that has been distributed in every single country in the world, including North Korea. <laughs> and, and so like, so that's about representation and that's about race and that's about being non-Eurocentric and the world waking up to that. And I'm surprised it's taken this long for, so for the media to wake up to that. But now in Hollywood, you know, people are going, oh, the international market is almost more important than the domestic market. And when they mean international, they mean the rest of the world as opposed to America. Um, but I was doing international way back then. But I think the thing is, the most important thing is if you're a storyteller, is knowing why you want to tell the story. If you know why you want to do what you want to do, then, then it's much easier to convey what you want to do in slightly covert um, ways if you want to get money, you know? But that is really interesting. So even you feel that even today you might oh, yeah. have to do things in slightly covert, but because, because people think that the social impact message won't sell or because they're just makes them uncomfortable. I think they're scared. And I think right now it's an interesting time because people are, you know, nervous of being woke, nervous of saying the wrong thing culturally. And I think as a result, people aren't doing things. So for example, with The Simpsons, everyone sort of was very upset about Apu, right? But for many years, he was the only, Asian on mainstream American TV, right? Even though he was like that and a white guy was doing it. However, it, he was being, he, there was some warmth in that character. But when the hoo-ha came, and they're all, you know, lefty liberals, the people at The Simpsons, what they did was put him away. So they retired him kind of thing, and they don't know what to do with him for fear of getting it wrong. So this is where we have to come in now, I think, and, and, and talk about owning how we tell our stories and allowing us to take them, take control of them. Because, see, I strongly believe that people who are monocultural and monolingual haven't got a clue how to tell stories that are multicultural and multilingual because it's just not their experience, you know? And that goes both ways. So I was offered uh, the Marigold projects, you know, the scripts. And Graham Broadbent is lovely, the producer. I love him to bits, you know. And he gave me the script and I read it and I said, okay, I can understand these other characters, but what are the Indians doing? I don't understand the Indian stories, you know. And I kept sort of asking about that. And in the end, I just left it because I thought, oh, it's really about the English characters. It's not really about the Indians. And sure enough, in the final movies that did very well and had I done them, I, you know, I would have been much wealthier than I am. But the point is, I still do get like this when I see Dev Patel going, oh, blame me, and all this, you know. So to put my name to that was hard for me. So it, it, you, and Graham is wonderful, right? He's gay, he's a fantastic producer. But, you know, it, it's those nuances that, that we're in that world of nuances now, particularly after BLM, you know, which did an awful lot, and Me Too. We're now in the world where we have to look at 
the, how the, our stories are being told and who controls our stories, uh, particularly with social media. So question, anyone stick your hand up if you've got a question. Yes, uh, have we got some roving microphones? Yes, there's one coming to you now. Thank you, uh, Michelle, and also Gurinder. It's a pleasure to meet you. I have a personal story to bend it like Beckham, which I will save for later. My question, and it's a personal struggle at the moment, how do you feel when someone says BAME, Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic, or in America sometimes you're referred to as BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, Persons of Color? Um, what kind of emotions does that evoke? Well, I think it's a dialogue. I think it's part of a dialogue because I remember when people said Afro-Caribbean, you know, and coloured, you know. And so I think that there's always people wanting to define us. Now what you have is people saying uh, on surveys, are you British Indian, British Bangladeshi, British Muslim? You know, so these definitions are constantly evolving, I think. And, you know, they're useful and one needs them to organise a society. Uh, on the other hand, it's always up to us to, um, you know, it's up to us to keep opening that dialogue and keep that dialogue going as to how we are defined and how we see ourselves and um, keep shifting, shifting those definitions. What do you tend to use yourself? Uh, I tend to call myself a British Indian filmmaker. Okay. Um, yes, Yvonne. Go for it. You've got the microphone already. <laughs> I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> thanks so much. And thanks for everything that you shared with us this morning, Rinda. Um, I do have a slight comparison with you getting money for uh, your films. So mine goes back to raising money for Choice FM. Yeah. Um, and raising my bit of money to put into Choice FM. Mm -hmm. I was always told oh, black music will never catch on. Oh, my God. That's what I was told when I applied not only to a bank, but to friends. Eventually, I persuaded my parents to remortgage their house and lend me the money. Yeah. That was a big, you know, that, that was how sure I was about it, and I'm glad that I did. But my other question is, or my question is, um, how do you feel or how do you think, do you think you would have fared better if you were a white female, even doing the same film, or a white male looking for money for the same film? Well, I try not to go down that rabbit hole because it's obvious that it, the answer is yes, it would be different. But I try not to go down that rabbit hole because uh, what it ends up doing is weakening me, right? And that's the other thing, I think. I think it's really important to acknowledge that there is heinous racism and sexism in our society. We all know that, right? Um, the most important thing is for us not to define ourselves by it and for us to be empowered as we move forward. So I try not to, um, you know, look at, look at it that way because I look at it the other way, by giving you the statistic about... Um, Bend it, you know. No other filmmaker's got that, you know, and that's mine, you know. So, you know, so I think, you know, we, you know, I think a more interesting question is if I, if my par if there hadn't been the partition of India and my homeland, which is now Pakistan, if I'd have been in the India side, if my, if the British hadn't taken my grandparents to Africa, to Kenya, and we'd stayed in India and I'd been an Indian filmmaker, you know, I think my life might have been different in because I think uh, in India, you know, female filmmakers are taken more seriously, actually. So I think it's more of that to discuss rather than the rabbit hole. I mean, it's interesting now that um, people, you know, are trying to employ women of colour and it's amazing what Shonda Rhimes has done and Ava DuVernay and interestingly in the year 2000 I made a film called What's Cooking in LA about four families culturally mixed families celebrating Thanksgiving and my publicist on that film was Ava uh, you know and I was like wow this girl's going somewhere and boy did she ever you know so um, I think that we 
we need we always need to be empowered and my message has always been either challenge prejudice in all its forms but also empowerment so there's no way i can ever make a film where the people of color within it or the females are not empowered and coming out on top you know that's and, and i'm happy that we're in that place right now i was just telling someone earlier i got sent a script just last week uh, written by Kevin Kwan, who, who is the author of Crazy Rich Asians. And um, he specifically wanted it to come to me because he said I would be the only person who understood the humour. And boy, is it funny. Oh, my God, it's so funny. Full of genial racism, as I call it, you know, which is, Ben Delight Beckham is full of that as well, by the way. But what it is, is it's, he's not at all encumbered by experiences of diaspora and you know he's not looking to talk about being Chinese American or, or any of that he's like here are these rich kids this is their crazy life and these are the parents who are self-made billionaires and this is them having pots at the white guy that she wants to marry basically it's that simple but by being free of all these arguments and people going, oh, can we, are we allowed to say that? Oh, can Asians say that? Or can we say that about Asians? Or can we, uh, he's completely free of it and he's created something that's very, very funny to me. Now, other people might look at it and go, oh, I don't know, I don't know. But I find that quite liberating at this point, you know? And, and, and at the same time, I also got sent another project about um, a lawyer in South Africa, Indian lawyer who defended the Sharpeville Six and its history and how the, the, the traverse, you know, how justice was just so blatantly, uh, you know, a travesty at that time. And it's a salient reminder going back now to look at how apartheid worked. And it's, and it, uh, oh my God, it's very resonant to today, basically, particularly when you look at what's going on in America right now. So I'm like, oh, God, both of these are great projects, but they both speak to different sides of me. So for me, I'm, you know, really lucky that I'm now in a space where I can look at these nuanced projects that people are out there writing, and I can say yes to the Sharpeville, you know, project, which made me cry uh, as I read it, and then I had to go and find the soundtrack to Cry Freedom and put that on and, you know, get into the mood. And then uh, this Chinese one, which is just so fucking funny that I'm crying with laughter. Are you making either of these? I'm going to make both of them. <laughs> OK. I'm going to make both of them. Now we, now we know what to look out for. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gurinder. I think we've been really lucky to have you here to start the day. And um, it's been lovely to see you again. Thank and you. good luck with everything that you do Thank in the future. You. Thank you so much. Thank you.